Charles Howard Schmidt Jr., or Smitty, as he was known to his friends, was once a popular guy, especially with a high school crowd who hung around the various teen hotspots on Speedway Boulevard. On the surface, it was easy to see why Schmidt was well-liked, in some cases even idolized by those younger than him. He drove around in a cool car, had his own place, and plenty of money to spend. Aside from his material possessions, Schmidt also had a certain way with words. He would impress his male friends with outrageous stories about how tough and fearless he was. Teenage girls would often flock to him. His good looks, wit, and bad boy bravado made him irresistible. But the truth is, all of Schmidt's boasting and all the little idiosyncrasies that made him stand out weren't just the harmless quirks of a misunderstood anti-hero. They were, in fact, the psychotic ramblings and acts of a total madman. Schmid would eventually find himself in a world of trouble, the kind of trouble that gets nationwide attention. In the March 4, 1966 issue of Life magazine, writer Don Moser exposed the entire country to the life and crimes of Charles Schmid Jr. Moser wrote, At the time of his arrest last November, Charles Schmid was 23 years old. He wore face makeup and dyed his hair. He habitually stuffed three or four inches of old rags and tin cans into the bottoms of his high top boots to make himself taller than his five foot three, and would stumble about so awkwardly while walking that some people thought he had wooden feet. He pursed his lips and let his eyelids droop in order to emulate his idol, Elvis Presley. He bragged to girls that he knew a hundred ways to make love, that he ran dope, and he was a hell's angel. Moser went on to add he occasionally shocked even those who thought they knew him well. A friend says that he once saw Schmitty tie a string to the tail of his pet cat, swing it around his head, and beat it bloody against a wall. Then he turned calmly and asked, You feel compassion? Why? Dangerous, cruel, and manipulative, yet revered by his teenage followers. This is the shocking true story of the Pied Piper of Tucson. Welcome to Episode 3 of El Presidio Project. Uncovering the creepy side of the old Pueblo. This is El Presidio Project. Strange Tales of Tucson. Hey everybody, Dini here with the July 2017 installment of El Presidio Project. I'm taking a step back from ghosts and other things that go bump in the night for this episode in order to dive into a bit of Tucson history. Make no mistake though, this is very much a horror story. Having grown up here, this case has always fascinated me. Not so much because of the crimes that were committed, that part still makes my skin crawl, but because it's a complete mystery to me how Schmid was able to have so much power over these young kids he used to hang around with. Schmid was completely unhinged and would go from portraying himself as this cool, rebellious badass to telling people he was afflicted with some incurable disease and how his short stature was caused by some childhood defect, which wasn't true at all, but they believed him and they felt sorry for him. And even when he spoke about his murderous impulses and then acted on those impulses, these teenagers still thought he was the greatest thing ever. How does that happen? He was like a pre-Charles Manson in a way. Had he not been caught, I believe he would have eventually gone on to kill more people. So early in the planning stages of this podcast project, I knew I wanted to do an episode on this guy. His story and the victims he left behind are very much a part of this city's history, and I would have been crazy not to include this crime case in these strange tales of Tucson. With that said, I now present to you Episode 3, Pontotoc. 
It was early June of 1964 when the people of Tucson were introduced to a 15-year-old girl named Eline Rowe. A photo of the Palo Verde High School sophomore was published along with an article in the Arizona Daily Star. Eline vanished from her east side residence on the night of May 31st, soon after her mother Norma left for work. Due to the fact that there was no evidence of a struggle or any other indication that would suggest Aline had been the victim of a crime, the local police department suspected the missing teen had simply run away from home. At that point in time, law enforcement, specifically the juvenile division, had seen an increase in teenage runaway cases. A lot of kids, especially those not native to the area, would discover the small city desert life wasn't really for them and would take off, usually with friends or with someone they were dating. Aline's mother never bought into this theory. She insisted her daughter had no reason to run away from home and claimed Aline wasn't the type of kid who would suddenly decide to disconnect from her friends and family. Miss Rowe also noted the only thing missing from her daughter's wardrobe was a black swimsuit and a shift blouse a runaway, or a victim of something heinous. No one knew. Aline's classmates, friends, and acquaintances were questioned. No one knew a thing, or rather, no one stepped forward with any information. Days turned into weeks, and not a single clue surfaced. In March of 1965, approximately nine months after her disappearance, Miss Rose hopes of finding her daughter alive dwindled with each passing day. Miss Rowe, dissatisfied with the police's efforts, reached out to the head of the FBI in Arizona, the state attorney general, and even a renowned New Jersey psychic known for locating missing persons. But nothing came of it. As time went on, the people of Tucson began to focus on other matters. President Johnson addresses a joint session of Congress to push a voting rights bill aimed at ending discrimination. It would appoint federal voting registrars in some instances and put an end to complicated literacy tests and other hampering tactics. The president referred to the events in Selma as an American tragedy. As units of the 173rd Airborne probe the surrounding jungle, 105 millimeter howitzers are landed by copter, set up, and ready to shell any red positions that might be spotted. With more troops committed to Vietnam by the U.S., forecasts are being made for an even stormier period ahead. Military experts feel that soon the Viet Cong may attack in battle array, something they have so far avoided. With news pouring in daily about the civil rights movement, the conflict in Vietnam, and other pressing topics, the story of young Aline somewhat faded away. But in August of 1965, two other teenage girls went missing. Once again, the city of Tucson paused and took notice. 17-year-old Gretchen Fritz and her 13-year-old sister Wendy were last seen on the evening of August 16th. The pair had left in the family car to catch a movie at the Cactus Drive-In, once located on 22nd Street and Alvernon. Friends of the girls confirmed they had seen Gretchen and Wendy at the drive-in that night. However, no one had heard from them since. About a week later, the Fritz family car was found abandoned near the downtown area at the Flamingo Hotel. The speedometer had been tampered with and mud was found on the floor on both the front and back seats. But much like the Aline Rowe case, there was no evidence that the girls had been harmed in any way. Tips from concerned citizens led detectives as far south as Guayma, Sonora, as it was rumored the Fritz sisters had run away and gone to Mexico. But law officials weren't the only ones looking for Gretchen and Wendy. In a plot twist straight out of a Hollywood movie, it was said members of the mob approached a young man Gretchen had been dating and questioned him. The young man's name was Charles Schmidt Jr. Agitated by his encounter with these mobsters poking around in his business, Schmidt placed a call to the FBI and even tried to get through to J. Edgar Hoover himself. According to Cold-Blooded, the Tucson Murders, written by the late John Gilmore, 
Schmid was somewhat forced to go to California with a couple of Mafia henchmen to search for Gretchen and Wendy. As he had mentioned to them, Gretchen was seeing a boy in San Diego and heard the sisters were there. In a performance probably worthy of an Academy Award nomination, Schmid spent his time in San Diego, walking up and down the beaches with photos of the sisters asking complete strangers if they had seen them, all the while knowing the truth. Schmid knew very well Gretchen and Wendy weren't in San Diego. They were dead, murdered by strangulation at his home and then taken to a remote location in the Tucson desert and left there. But why would Charles Schmidt Jr. kill his former girlfriend and her little sister? The answer to that question could be traced back to one person, Aline Rowe. May 31, 1964. Aline was lured away from her home by an older female friend who lived a few doors down from the Rowe family. 17-year-old Mary French was dating Schmidt at the time, and old Schmidt was apparently looking for a girl to kill. I want to know what it feels like. I bet I could get away with it, he reportedly told French and other members of his inner circle. Schmidt had even created a list of potential victims. Instead of going to the police, French tried to contact these girls, but they never answered their phones that night. The next person on the list did, and agreed to tag along with the group as soon as her mother left for work. With curlers in her hair and dressed in a shift blouse and black swimsuit, Aline took off with French, Schmid, and Schmid's buddy, John Saunders, on what she thought was going to be a quick Sunday night cruise. Schmid ended up driving his party to the middle of nowhere and turned off on Harrison Road. They all exited the vehicle and walked out into the desert, chatting along the way. French and Schmid decided to go back to the car to retrieve a radio. On their way back, they heard Eileen scream. Schmid ordered Mary French to wait in the car. She did as she was told, no questions asked. Minutes later, Eileen Rowe was dead. The 15-year-old girl was raped and murdered by Schmid, and Saunders helped. French, Saunders, and Schmid buried Eileen, returned to their homes, and carried on with their lives. July 1964. Less than two months after the Rowe murder, Schmid was on the prowl once again. While cruising around the Himmel Park swimming pool, he spotted a pretty young blonde named Gretchen Fritz. Schmidty had a thing for blondes, so much so if he happened to be dating a girl with dark hair, he would eventually convince them to go blonde. Sometimes he would even dye their hair himself. Schmid followed Gretchen home that day and managed to charm his way into her home by posing as a door-to-door -door salesman. Soon after, Gretchen and Schmid started seeing each other regularly. But Gretchen Fritz turned out to be more than just another link in Schmid's chain of romantic conquests. Schmid's inability to keep his mouth shut and his distorted belief that Gretchen would be impressed by his murderous past led him to confess to her that he had killed Aline Rowe. As their relationship began to crumble under the weight of Schmid's confession and his numerous affairs, Gretchen threatened to tell her father and the police about Aline. Suddenly, Gretchen had the upper hand in their disturbing relationship, and Schmid had to put a stop to it. The following summer, on that fateful night in mid-August, the Fritz sisters went to Schmid's home on their way back from the cactus drive-in. Schmid had reached his breaking point and had grown tired of his girlfriend's threats. He killed Gretchen first, then Wendy. Alone, with no one to help him this time around, Schmid somehow still managed to remove the siblings from his home and into the trunk of the Fritz family car without being noticed. He then drove north, all the way to the Catalina foothills area, and disposed of their bodies. Schmid once again couldn't keep his evil deeds to himself. He had to tell someone. That someone turned out to be his good friend, Richie Bruns. A native of Ohio, Bruns was tall, thin, and a bit of an outcast. He had served time at the Fort Grant Juvenile Facility and lacked the verbal skills Schmidt had. Bruns was blunt and direct. 
He frequently had it out with Gretchen Fritz. She couldn't stand Richie, which was okay by him because the feeling was mutual. Knowing how Richie felt about Gretchen and being the demented braggart that he was, Schmidt admitted to the Fritz murders and even took Bruns to see their bodies, right around the time the mob was breathing down Schmidt's neck for information. He also told Richie about Eileen Rowe. But Bruns was dealing with his own problems. He had fallen in love with one of Schmidt's former girlfriends. She wasn't as serious about their relationship as Bruns was. This drove him insane with jealousy, and he ended up stalking her on a daily basis. It got so bad, Bruns was ultimately arrested by the police for harassment. Rather than send him back to Fort Grant, the judge decided to place him under the care of his grandmother in Ohio for 90 days. This would give him time to cool off, but he didn't cool off at all. In fact, his obsession became worse. For some unknown reason, Bruns believed Schmidt was going to murder the girl he loved next. Fearing for her safety, he placed a call to the Tucson Police Department. He told them absolutely everything. Finally, someone had come forward with the truth. Would you be willing to show us where the bodies are? asked the detective. Bruns replied, yes, just get me back to Tucson. On the morning of November 10, 1965, Richie Bruns led police officers and detectives to the desolate Pontotoc Road and showed them the remains of Gretchen and Wendy Fritz. Bruns was given a pass and not charged with keeping the murders a secret. John Saunders and Mary French, however, were arrested and eventually sentenced to prison for their participation in the Roe murder. Saunders received a life sentence while French was given five years. Charles Schmidt Jr. was also taken into custody and was tried twice, each time creating a media frenzy like the city of Tucson had never seen before. Schmidt was sentenced to death for the murder of the Fritz sisters. In the second trial, he was represented by a young hotshot attorney from Massachusetts named F. Lee Bailey. Schmidt pleaded guilty in that case and was given a life sentence for the murder of Eileen Rowe, whose body was yet to be discovered. On July 23, 1967, three years after Schmidt, Saunders, and French led Rowe into the Tucson desert, Charles Schmidt Jr. finally agreed to show the police where they had buried her. While in handcuffs and under the watchful eye of the police and the press, Schmidt located the spot and began to dig. That day, a murderer exhumed the body of his young and helpless victim. He even held Aline's skull in his hands. But Schmidt showed no signs of remorse whatsoever. While awaiting his trip to the gas chamber, Schmidt wrote the following in his journal. From nothing at birth into nothing at death, no more is death just a concept, or idea, or a conundrum. It is tapping you on the shoulder, and whispering in your ear, and the vacant haunting eyes mock you, ever patient, ever waiting. On March 20th, 1975, Charles Schmidt Jr. was viciously attacked by two fellow inmates. He died, ten days later, at the age of 33. Coming up next in the Weekend Creep Show report, I'll be continuing my coverage of the Pied Piper murders by discussing a few films and a documentary series based on this infamous Tucson crime. The good, the bad, and everything in between. It's the Weekend Creep Show report. Alrighty, so I'm going to start with a feature film called The Lost, which was released in 2008 and based on the novel of the same name written by Jack Ketchum. The Lost features actor Mark Center as teenage psychopath Ray Pye. The story takes place in modern times, but right from the opening shot, you can see the similarities between Pye and Charles Schmidt. Pye's sort of walking around awkwardly through the woods to the tune of, what else, the Pied Piper song, performed by British pop singer Crispin St. Peters. Incidentally, that song came out in March of 1966, right around the time the Life magazine article about Schmidt was published. 
Anyway, Mark Center is pretty spot on in this role, and in my opinion, makes the film worth watching. This is definitely not the kind of movie you want to see if you're squeamish, though. It's pretty brutal, especially at the end when Ray goes on his rampage. But aside from the obvious Schmid references, there's little nods here and there to Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, which I thought was pretty cool. I picked up a DVD copy of The Lost on Amazon for $5, so if you're willing to shell out a couple of bucks and check it out, go for it. I also saw the short film Dawn, directed by actress Rose McGowan, who's been in tons of TV shows and movies, my favorite being the grindhouse horror Planet Terror. While The Lost focused more on the fictional representation of Charles Schmid, Dawn tells the story from the fictional Aline Rose perspective, and it also takes place around the same time period, maybe a few years earlier but I thought it was excellent, and for me, it really captured the subject matter very well. It's horrifying and heartbreaking. If you'd like to see it, it's available right now on YouTube. Last on the list is a documentary series from the Investigation Discovery Channel called A Crime to Remember. Season 2, Episode 5 deals with the actual story of the Pied Piper, with reenactments and interviews with people who worked the case, including former Pima County Sheriff Clarence Dupnick. A definite must-see, A Crime to Remember, is available on Hulu. Also, you might want to check out the short story, Where Are You Going, Where Have You Been, by Joyce Carol Oates, which tells the story of a Schmidt-like character luring a young girl away from her home. And with that, I've come to the end of this episode. As always, thank you for listening. Take care, everybody. I'll be back next month. Don't forget to follow El Presidio Project and Facebook on Twitter. Bye-bye.